Look, if I uh, disappear, it's the mosquitoes. They've uh, flown, they pick me up and throw me away. They're everywhere. But that's what happens after a flood. Now, I want to discuss Eureka Day, the 3rd of December, which is very soon. It's Saturday, the 3rd of December this year, and it marks the 168th anniversary of the Eureka Rebellion. A blip in time, just a little blip. But interestingly, the Eureka Rebellion has had profound ramifications for decades. But I think we'll go back to the beginning and actually clarify what the rebellion is about, because unfortunately, there are many stories about the Eureka Rebellion, rebellion that have nothing to do with reality. They're all about people trying to reinforce their own opinions about what it meant without looking at the reality. The reality is very simple. When gold was first discovered in 1851 in Victoria, the squatters who controlled Victoria, 700 squatters, and the squatters weren't um, poor people, who didn't have anything. Squatters were people who had money, who had resources, who had backing from England. So when Melbourne was first colonised in late 1835, it was quite colonised for one very good reason, for three enterprise. Private investment for private profit. The ship that left Tasmania, that came to Victoria, to colonise Victoria was called the Free Enterprise. It was actually not a government initiated colonisation process. It was initiated by private investors. Now, over 100,000 people, original inhabitants, Aborigines, had lived in Victoria for over 60,000 years. And within 10, 15 years of colonisation, 100,000 had been reduced to less than 2,000. And Aboriginal people were dispossessed in the most brutal ways, and you know that. Whether it was through firepower, whether it was through poison, whether it was through disease, violent dispossession, rape, murder, the story's there. And the good thing about 2022 is that we're beginning to hear the story of the colonisation process. So who were the benefactors? The benefactors were the 700 business owners who had claimed this land as their own despite it being inhabited and owned for over 60,000 years by the original inhabitants. They claimed this land and they claimed this land for one very good reason, to grow sheep, to send wool to the satanic mills in England which were employing four and five year olds. This is what it was like in the late 1830s, early 1940s. So by 1851-52, the squatters were firmly established in Victoria. In 1851, Victoria gained its independence from New South Wales and became a colony in its own right. And that meant a legislative council was established. And that legislative council was dominated by the squatters because they were the only ones who were actually able to stand for election. See, when gold was discovered, they were horrified. They were horrified because it meant the cheap labour they were using to raise their sheep and shear their sheep and make their extraordinary profits by exporting wool to the satanic mills in England was at risk because they relied on ticket of leave men and women, ex-convicts coming down to Victoria to provide that cheap labour and also some immigrant labour which was coming in. And obviously, if gold is discovered, that cheap labour will disappear to the gold fields in an attempt to win its fortunes. It's a little bit like Australians going to the Tats Lotto office every Saturday, Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, whenever they buy their Tats Lotto tickets in order to win big, in order to radically change their lives. It's the same with gold prospecting. It's the same with gold prospecting. Now the Legislative Council made a huge decision 
which influenced, which created the conditions for the Eureka Rebellion. And that decision was not to tax the gold that had come out of the ground, but to tax the people who were mining the gold. And they hoped by having high miners' fees, and it was up to five pounds a month for a tiny piece of land, they were able to stop people flooding the gold fields. How wrong they were. When the discovery of gold was um, became common knowledge, people from all parts of the world flocked to the Victorian gold fields as well as the labourers that were working at that particular point in time. And the question of a gold licence became a real issue, a significant issue, because 99.5% of people did not find gold, but they were lumbered with this huge mining licence. So protest movements grew around Victoria. They grew in Castlemaine, in Ballarat, in Bendigo, and many other places in Victoria where gold had been discovered. So within a short, few short years, tens of thousands of people from all over the world had flocked to the Victorian gold fields. And many of these people were refugees. These were hardened political activists who were aware of the situation. Refugees from the failed 1848 wave of revolutions that swept over Europe. Refugees from the English Chartist movement, which had been struggling for decades to get universal male suffrage. And these refugees and other immigrants who had come to the gold fields resented the mining licence. They resented the mining licence because it was an unfair licence. It wasn't the gold that was extracted which was taxed, it was the miner themselves. And as I said before, this happened to keep labour on the gold fields. So this is the background. Now there were revolts and rebellions around Victoria. But the miners in Ballarat were very well organised. On the 11th of November 1854, the Ballarat Reform League was formed. And you can still see the Ballarat Reform League Charter. And the Ballarat Reform League was the organisation which was responsible ultimately for miners taking up arms and defending what they believed to be their rights and liberties. This is not some small businessman's, you know, revolt against the system or a racist revolt against people of different nationalities as a lot of people think. This was a universal movement and its ideas are encapsulated in the Eureka Oath. We swear by the Southern Cross to stand truly by each other and fight to defend our rights and liberties. That's right, the Eureka Oath. We didn't say men, women, blacks, white, yellow, pink. It said we, the people here on the gold fields. We swear by the Southern Cross. Now, the Southern Cross is not a religious reference. If you're in the gold fields, you live in a tent city. And when you look up in the sky, you will see the Southern Cross. Even now, if you look up in the sky at night, you'll see the Southern Cross. But you cannot see the Southern Cross from the Northern Hemisphere. So when people lay in their tents, looked up in the sky, they realised they were in a different part of the world the Southern Hemisphere. We swear by the Southern Cross to stand truly by each other. Solidarity was at the heart of the movement. As long as you were against the mining licence, you were part of that movement. It didn't matter where you came from, your religious beliefs didn't matter, it didn't matter what colour you were, and I'll go into that later on. You were part of that movement. We swear by the Southern Cross to stand truly by each other and fight to defend our rights and liberties. This is 1854, when the world is dominated by monarchs and empires. And these people believed they were born with amiable rights that no 
corporation, no business, no government, no religion could take away from them. So we've got a real quadrant of activity. The Ballarat Reform League was fascinating because they practice true democracy, not the representative democracy you see here in Australia where every three to four years you elect a representative to make decisions for you. Their democracy was based on the delegate system and the mass meetings. Sometimes you had up to 15 to 20,000 people from a population of 20, 25,000 in Ballarat meeting. This is without PA systems, without cameras, without technology, projecting their voice from the platform, coming to decisions, ratifying those decisions, organising, electing delegates, sending those delegates to Melbourne to negotiate with the authorities and Governor Hotham. And then those delegates returned back to those mass meetings to discuss what had happened. This is direct democracy, true democracy, and obviously taking up arms. There's nothing more direct, as far as direct action is concerned, than taking up arms to defend your rights and liberties. So the four central tenets, the four pillars, the four foundation stones of the Eureka Rebellion and not what you read in most history books or hear in most accounts of Eureka. The four foundation stones of the Eureka Rebellion are internationalism. For example, when the Eureka Rebellion was crushed and people were arrested, the first man who was tried for high treason in Melbourne in 1855 and acquitted was John Joseph, a black freed, was John Joseph, a black freed slave from New York in America. He was charged with killing Captain Wise, shooting him, wounding him, and Captain Wise was the deputy commander of the British forces on the field that day. And he was acquitted. And if you look at the names, the roll call of the men who died, if you go to the Eureka Cemetery, which we will on the 3rd of December, and look at the names on the mass graves, you will see there are Jews buried there. There are people from all corners of the earth, different religious persuasions, and people with no religious persuasions. The Melbourne media, the day after the rebellion, um, identified the participants in the, in the rebellion as anarchists and ruffians. That's right, anarchists and ruffians. But these were people from around the world internationalism. As I said before, so what happened? On the 11th of November the Ballarat Reform League was formed. On the 27th of November 1854, the Eureka Oath, we swear by the Southern Cross to stand truly by each other and fight to defend our rights and liberties, was sworn at Bakery Hill. On the 2nd of December 1854, which was a Saturday, over 1,500 armed men drilled and they selected the captains of the various groups. On Sunday, the 3rd of December, a day which the rebels never fought, the British authorities and the British police would soil with their blood because it was a Sunday, God's day of rest. There are less than 100, there are about 104 people left in the stockade and over 250 mounted police, Victorian police, and uh, soldiers, it was almost 400, and soldiers ran through the encampment, the Eureka Stockade, within 15 minutes. Some people died during that initial confrontation. The people who suffered the most casualties were the pikemen. These were men who held up crude, made pikes in an attempt to stop the horses running through the camps. There were 30 of them. Most of them, many of them were Irish rebels. Half of them died in that confrontation. But in that 10 to 15 minutes that they were able to hold up the horses, the mounted police and the mounted soldiers and the foot soldiers, it gave the other people in the encampment time to escape. But this was the beginning of the massacre. A massacre not carried out by the British soldiers who were relatively well disciplined, but a massacre 
carried out by the Victoria Police, which had been formed in 1853, a police force which has never acknowledged or apologised for that massacre. And for the next three hours, they arranged up to five kilometres from the stockade site, stealing gold, killing people, burning tents. And this created a great deal of hostility between the Victoria Police and people in regional Victoria. Now the authorities were shocked by their reaction around Victoria and people weren't celebrating the Eureka Massacre. They were angry. They were talking about rebellion in Geelong, rebellion in Bendigo, rebellion all over Victoria. And in an attempt to cool down the situation, after the 13 Eureka rebels were acquitted by juries in Melbourne in early 1855, they negotiated with the rebels. And every one of their demands, which you will see in the charter of the Eureka rebels, the Ballarat Reform League's charter, charter was acknowledged to. The leaders of the rebellion were set free. They were allowed to sit in elections and many of them within 12 months of being involved in an armed struggle against the British Empire were sitting in the Houses of Parliament. But this is not the end of the story. This is not the end. This is the beginning. As I said before, we found this was the beginning of the story because that radical rump continued to exist in Victoria. They continued to attempt to break down the power of the squatters. They continued to attempt to radicalise Parliament. And they set up an alternative Parliament across the road from the Victorian Parliament, which met with a delegate system for over 10 years, radicalising the agenda in the Victorian Parliament. This year is the 150th anniversary of the introduction of free secular compulsory education in Victoria. The first place on the planet that introduced free secular compulsory education. Over 600 schools were built within 12 months. We saw the miners license disappear. We saw universal male suffrage. And in regional Victoria, we saw a simmering hatred for the Victoria police. And to a significant degree, the Kelly Gam was successful in regional Victoria because they were, in some way, the descendants of that rebellion. People supported the Kelly Gang in various ways because they saw them as a reaction to a corrupt police force which had led a massacre against unarmed men and women. So why do we celebrate it in 1854? This year is the 168th anniversary. Unfortunately, the Ballarat City Council, a conservative council, has never flown the Eureka flag on the main flagpole in Ballarat. Not even for the 150th anniversary celebration in 2004. It's a disgrace. The businesses, corporations, institutions, a city council, to a significant degree in Ballarat, use the symbols, the Eureka flag, they use the symbols of the Eureka Rebellion to augment their powers and profit, but never contribute to keeping the ideas alive. And when it comes to protecting the Eureka Rebellion, they run a hundred miles like they did last year during the height of the anti-vaccination movement which attempted to co-opt the Eureka Rebellion. So we go on. We celebrate. The Reclaim the Radical Spirit of the Eureka Rebellion celebrations, this marks our 21st year. The history of Eureka is the history of groups coming and going, coming and going. We're growing old. Many of our members have died. So in order to ensure that this celebration continues, we have formed an official association with Ballarat Trades Hall. And Ballarat Trades Hall is the centre of the spirit, that radical spirit of the Eureka Rebellion, because they understand the significance. 
the people in Ballarat Trades Hall, the Western Region, understand. And they're sick and tired, like we are, of other people using the Eureka Rebellion without understanding what it was about as a symbol to promote their racist agenda, as a symbol to promote some type of, you know, general resistance, which has, you know, um, rebels without a cause. As if the Eureka Rebellion would support anti-vaxxers in 2002. As if they knew what disease was. They died in their thousands. They welcome vaccination. So let's move on. So this year, what, what is the celebrations? Again, it is not a full celebration. Hopefully next year we'll have the full celebration. But the, the celebrations start at 4am at Eureka Park. That's right, 4am for the dawn ceremony at the corner of Eureka and Stall Street in Ballarat. Communal breakfast follows between 6 and 9am and at 10am we meet at Bakery Hill to distribute six Eureka Australia medals to Australian activists whose life, life long work encapsulates the ideas incorporated in the, in the Eureka in the Eureka Oath. Then we will meet at the cemetery to pay, at the Eureka Monument to pay our respects to those men buried there. 168 years buried in a mass grave. From then we'll make our way to Trades Hall for a late lunch and drinks which we'll, Trades Hall will provide. And after that at about 3 p.m., between 3 and 4 p.m., I'll be hosting a session about the Eureka flag at the Eureka Centre. On the 3rd of December, there are no admission charges to the Eureka Centre. So you're more than welcome to come and hear me speak about the flag, its symbolism, why it's there. And after that, we will have a late lunch in the park. So it'll be about 12 hours. So let's see you there. Saturday, the 3rd of December. Saturday, the 3rd of December, 4 a.m. to 7 p.m. Come and join us. Hopefully next year we'll be able to have a Eureka dinner and do all the, uh, what we call the, uh, the sections of uh, the Eureka Rebellion. So thank you once again. See you on the 3rd of December. You can't make it this year. There's next year, the year after and the year after.